to look at the photographs that have gener generously been provided by the Annenberg Space for Photography, their exhibit Refugee, uh, which are very compelling. Right after lunch, we'll reconvene for our prize ceremony, a video presentation, and remarks from several more speakers. And with that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning, Mary Robinson. Mary Robinson was the first woman president of Ireland, as I'm sure all of you know. She's also the former United, uh, United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and founder and president of Realizing Rights, the Ethical Globalization Initiative. Between March 2014 and August 2000, uh, March 2013 and August 2014, Mrs. Robinson was UN Secretary General's Special Envoy to the Great Lakes region in Africa. From August 2014, she was appointed UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Climate Change, and she currently serves as the President of the Mary Robinson Foundation for Climate Justice. She's a member of the Elders, former Chair of the Council of Women World Leaders, and a member of the Club of Madrid. We are very happy to welcome Mary Robinson back to the Hilton Prize Humanitarian uh, Hilton Humanitarian Prize Symposium stage where she will speak on climate justice and the future of humanitarian action. Mrs. Robinson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to come back to the annual Hilton Humanitarian Prize Symposium and to give the morning uh, keynote address. Uh, you are a wonderful audience. I've met so many friends since I came in the door, and I'm sure there are others that I'll meet in the course of today, but uh, you also represent great collective wisdom, and it's a pleasure to talk to you about this year's theme, because it is a very important theme, the future of humanitarian action. It's actually been in the forefront of my mind since I was appointed to yet another mandate last May, which is a mandate uh, to, as a special envoy of the, the UN Secretary General on El Nino and climate, together uh, with Ambassador Machario Kamau of Kenya. At the time, I simply wasn't aware of how bad the impacts of El Nino were, because this was a slow onset crisis and an invisible one. The reality is that the 2015-2016 El Nino event has adversely affected the lives and livelihoods and food security of over 60 million people in every region of the world, with the most severe impacts in East and Southern Africa, Central America, and the Pacific. The El Nino event itself has concluded. However, humanitarian needs due to drought and flooding will endure for many months into early 2017, and the broader economic and social impacts could ripple through generations. While forecasts for a La Nina event in late 2016 have weakened in recent weeks, if it occurs, La Nina may further impact communities whose coping capacities have already been overwhelmed by El Nino. The fundamental changes already taking place in our climate due to human activity will interact with future El Nino and La Nina events in ways that cannot be fully predicted. We do know that the El Nino, probably followed by La Nina, will come every three to seven years. That's predictable. That's the weather pattern that we're quite familiar with and can be uh, predicted. We must expect and prepare for future events to be more frequent and more severe. Those most impacted are among the least responsible for climate change. My visits to Ethiopia in June, to Honduras in the dry corridor of Central America at the end of July, to Southern Africa to meet with the SADC leaders at the end of August, and to Vietnam earlier this month, have brought home to me the level of human suffering and the clear gender impacts of climate change, as it's women who have to go further for water and try to hold their families together. In um, a rural part of Honduras, about three hours from the capital, I sat under a tree in some heat, listening to women <clears throat> speaking about the reality they were living, brought together by a very good local Honduran women's group. And they spoke of their desperation because they had no water. And one woman said to me, how do you live without water? And this is the reality that they were facing, and they felt very abandoned and very forgotten. 
I also saw striking examples of community resilience and adaptation. In Vietnam, I traveled two hours outside of Hanoi to visit a community project which captured beautifully the message of resilience. A local NGO, Serda, led by a visionary woman, Vu Thi Hien, had encouraged the formation of local self-help groups in Thai Nguyen pr province. She wanted them to be local self-help groups because women would feel comfortable in participating. She said the district level is the wrong level. Women would be intimidated. She persuaded the local authority to grant them the rights to protect and then sustainably exploit the benefit of the local forest. The approach is explicitly rights-based with a strong gender equality dimension, including local indigenous Da women who came down from the mountain in their beautiful traditional costumes. Six cooperatives have been formed and protect more than 4,000 hectares of forest. Illegal logging, as you probably know, is a real problem in Vietnam, but not in this district. One woman spoke about the project, what the project meant to her. She'd been too shy to speak initially, but now she feels empowered and strengthened because she's involved in the decisions that are being made. The trees will be allowed to grow for another four years, but already the communities are benefiting from fruits and traditional medicines, and the forest cover is helping local agriculture and livelihoods. I'll come back to this need for resilience, but first let me look at the broader picture. The future of humanitarian action is something which has taken the world's imagination of late, and it's a discussion that cannot come soon enough. At the World Humanitarian Summit in May, countries came together and recognized that humanitarian assistance alone will not adequately address nor sustainably reduce the needs of the world's most um, vulnerable people, a category, a category that's currently estimated to include over 130 million people. Participants, including world leaders, agreed that a new and coherent approach is required based on addressing root causes, increasing political diplomacy for prevention and conflict resolution, and bringing humanitarian development and peace-building efforts together. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, agreed last year, provides a practical and tangible bridge between the development and humanitarian communities, as well as an important rallying point for governments and key stakeholders, including civil society and the private sector, to reduce disaster and climate risk. The framework overshadowed, the, foreshadowed, sorry, the conclusions from the humanitarian summit. It noted that enhanced work to reduce exposure and vulnerability, thus prevent, preventing the creation of new disaster ri risks and accountability for disaster risk creation are needed at all levels. And most importantly, I believe, it identified that there has to be a broader and more people-centered preventive approach to disaster risk. Disaster risk reduction practices need to be multi-hazard and multi-sectoral, inclusive and accessible in order to be efficient and effective. The moral imperative and need for increased capacity to undertake preventative action within human-centered frameworks is now nowhere more stark than in how we respond to climate change. To some extent, humanitarian action will always have a reactive element. We cannot necessarily predict a natural disaster or a surge in civil strife. However, this is not the whole picture. When we look at the future of humanitarian action, it's very difficult to foresee a scenario in which climate change doesn't play a significant part. Climate change is a threat multiplier. Climate change not only increases the likelihood and severity of a range of sudden onset natural disasters, from hurricanes to wildfires, as well as driving slow onset events, such as drought, which increases the risk of social dislo dislocation and conflict. In 2015, the UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction conducted a 10-year review of the economic and human impact of disaster and found that 87% of disasters are climate-related. This is a figure that needs to be both acknowledged and addressed in the planning for any future humanitarian action. The impacts of climate change often affect the most vulnerable first and hardest. The most vulnerable who have done the least to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. This then represents not just a question of humanitarian action or responding to disasters as they happen, but also of justice. I'd like to warmly 
congratulate this year's um, win prize winners, the Task Force on Global Health. And I want to compliment them by actually drawing on one of their values in their vision. One of their values is consequential compassion. Empathy for those um, who are suffering, and this must be linked to effective action to alleviate their suffering. Empathy with those who are suffering, linked to effective action to alleviate their suffering. That's a very climate justice notion. The injustice of climate change is something that we have to take very seriously. Climate justice is a concept that I have championed with my foundation for some time. It links human rights and development to achieve a human-centered approach, safeguarding the rights of the most vulnerable people and sharing the burdens and benefits of climate change and its impacts equitably and fairly. Climate justice is informed by science, responds to science, and acknowledges the need for equitable stewardship of the world's resources. These two need to be the goals of humanitarian action, particularly when engaging climate-related impacts. Men and women are affected by climate change in different ways because of the societal and cultural roles and responsibilities made on them by families and communities. For example, in many communities, women are the primary food producers and providers of water and cooking fuel for their families. So changes in climate or disasters that affect these roles not only impact on women's ability to provide, but on the community as a whole. UN Women recently published a collation of data entitled Facts and Figures on Humanitarian Action and Conflict. It provides for some sobering reading. It found 60% of preventable maternal deaths take place in settings of conflict, displacement, and natural disasters. That one in five refugees or displaced women our displaced women in, in, in complex humanitarian settings are estimated to, experienced, to have experienced sexual violence and that this was likely an underestimation. And girls are almost 2.5 times more likely to be out of school in conflict-affected countries than their counterparts in conflict-free countries. The disproportionate impacts on women and girls of humanitarian disasters are not new developments in humanitarian crisis. They've been clear throughout our collective history. Yet despite this evident fact, only 4% of projects in UN interagency appeals were targeted at women and girls in 2014, and only 0.4% of all funding to fragile states most impacted by disasters went to women's groups or women's ministries from 2012 to 2013, 0.4%. In humanitarian action, we're failing women and children. This needs to change and not just in the field of humanitarian funding alone, but also across all aspects of disaster response and risk reduction, as well as in related climate change adaptation. A key to the solution is enabling women to participate in decision-making. Evidence demonstrates that the participation of women in decision-making processes and management roles lead to legal and in policy reforms that advance the interests, rights, and well-being of women and girls, as well as gender equality in general. Women are best placed to identify the needs and vulnerability of their communities and should be consulted and involved in decision-making in humanitarian preparedness and response. Women and girls also face increased risks when undertaking journeys to escape the impacts of climate change or situations which have been exacerbated by climate change. This has become increasingly clear, as we know, in Europe, sadly, in the last few years, as we work on responses to a movement of humanity unseen since World War II. In February, a report from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees indicated that 55% of those undertaking dangerous sea crossings and arriving on Mediterranean shores or dying um, in an attempt to do so are now women and children, compared with 27% last June. We can't claim ignorance of the grave risks faced by women and girls seeking sanctuary at a time of great upheaval. We know that women are disproportionately vulnerable when forcibly displaced from their homes. Existing social inequalities based on gender roles are exacerbated as traditional support structures and formal justice systems break down. We know that women face increased risks of violence, sexual assault, exploitation, and trafficking. Again, we need to see the need to incorporate gender-based considerations and women's leadership into the policy responses to migration flows, particularly in relation to displacement. Indeed, the realities of climate change will see displacement and mobility becoming key elements of humanitarian policy and decision-making, 
It's up to us to ensure that this is well planned and is people centered. Climate displacement is an issue which my foundation has now turned to with increased attention. It's an issue that's being recognized by world leaders and international processes, including at the meeting of the UN on the 19th of September on migration and refugees. It's recognized as one that requires a response, not least by humanitarian actors. Currently, the average number of people displaced by disasters each year is 24.5 million. However, this in itself is not the full picture. It doesn't account for slow onset events, such as droughts, or the more insidious aspects of environmental degradation. It also fails to account for voluntary migration, driven in part by changes in climate. Climate change, as I said, is a threat multiplier when it comes to displacement. It's linked to increased rural-urban migration, as smallholder farmers are forced off land that's affected by drought or ruined by tidal surges. There are linkages to conflict where populations struggle for dwindling resources and it's linked to wider migration and refugee flows where displacement leads to a breakdown in social cohesion where new minorities created by internal displacement face persecution. Clearly the most fundamental action that we can take to protect the rights of people at risk of climate displacement is to limit the impact of climate change as much as possible and thereby reduce the threat to populations in high risk areas. This is the responsibility of all countries and was affirmed in the Paris Agreement's commitment to keep the temperatures at well below two degrees above pre-industrial levels and pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels. Humanitarian actors have a responsibility to highlight this imperative as without action, we have no hope in responding to future humanitarian crises as climate change makes the planet a much more dangerous place. And may I just share with you some good news that I got um, in an email this morning. The European Union is going to ratify the climate agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement, next Tuesday. That's about 12% of emissions. We'll be over, we're already over the 55 countries. We're up to about 62 or 63. And, and, and that will be more, and we will be over the 55%. That means if it's done by the 7th of October, it will be in time to come into operation at COP22 in Morocco. That is fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> president Tang, the former president of Kiribati, has named his country's response to the threat of climate change as migration with dignity. Kiribati has purchased land in Fiji with the intention of migrating there should the impacts of climate change submerge their small island. That's why the 1.5 is so vital. If we go above 1.5, there is no question that it's unlikely that anybody can live in Kiribati. And so I hope this is an event that will not come to pass. However, the example shown by the government of Kiribati in preparing for the worst is something the humanitarian community can take away as a lesson in climate preparedness. Communities at risk of displacement as a result of climate change have a lot to lose. It isn't just the material and economic impacts that we often see taking center stage in policy documents. It's the social fabric that binds communities together, their culture, their identity. I remember my friend Ursula Rukova who's moving a small number of people, 1,500 people from her cataract island where they can no longer live to Papua New Guinea, um, quite a distance away. And she talked about buying the land there and then building relationships so this community can come and live in a new neighborhood with new neighbors. And then she says, and she says it with such sadness, but there is nothing we can do about the fact that we have to leave the home of the bones of our ancestors. And when she says that, I, I just feel for an indigenous people, that's just so tragic. But that's happening, and it's happening increasingly to communities. Um, she's doing her best, but she knows that she can't really um, replace um, the home of the bones of her ancestors. Climate change also prevents vulnerable populations from moving, even where this may be in their best interests. This, in turn, worsens humanitarian disasters when they come. Vulnerability to extreme events and the ability to move are both related to social, economic, and political status. The IPPC, IPCC acknowledged this in last year's report, in which they state, and I quote, vulnerability is inversely correlated with mobility, leading to those 
being most exposed and vulnerable to the impacts of climate change, having the least capacity to migrate. These so-called trapped populations are areas which require the attention of humanitarian organizations when assessing risk and identifying protections. Let me conclude by going back to my mandate on El Nino and climate by indicating how Ambassador Kamau and I propose to address the future of humanitarian action in the context of further El Nino, La Nina events. We propose and are in the, in the process of developing, in consultation with a wide group of stakeholders, a blueprint for action. The aim of the blueprint for action will be to significantly mitigate the future El Nino, La Nina episode by catalyzing and guiding the development of robust multi-stakeholder commitments at the national and regional level to build resilience and embed an approach based on prevention and early action in the most vulnerable countries. And we want this to begin in March 2017, when the worst impacts of this El Nino will be over for countries and they can begin to think of the future and look forward. The Blueprint for Action won't attempt to impose a one-size-fits-all solution to climate resilience efforts in diverse national and regional contexts, nor will it seek to replace or recreate existing global planning processes. We don't want to re reinvent any wheels. Rather, it will um, focus on advancing the implementation of these frameworks by providing a guide to the most critical actions that need to be taken and offering a framework to bring together and to catalyze the necessary investments. The Blueprint for Action is intended first and foremost simply as a tool to support the development of integrated plans at the national or regional levels in those member states most affected by El Nino and La Nina episodes. The Blueprint for Action could also provide a platform to bring together critical stakeholders, including donors, international financial institutions, civil society, and private sector, including insurers, partners, into shared commitments to support these plans. I hope this blueprint example will encourage us to think about other more integrated holistic approaches which emphasize prevention, preparedness and resilience in order to reduce the scale of the humanitarian responses where possible. It's the responsibility of the humanitarian community not just to focus on the figures, costs and donation flows when looking for solutions to these challenges, but to remember the people to whom the aid is being rendered including them in decision-making and the shaping of outcomes will lead to better and more equitable results for us all as we face the oncoming challenges of a warmer world, a new normal, um, a new normal in particular for countries that are more vulnerable. And above all else, let's continue to give hope. And I just want to conclude by a memory of being with Archbishop Desmond Tutu here in New York at a um, 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 social good conference of young people about four years ago. I was at the conference this year as well, and it's, it's great to see young people on their various forms of social media. And of course, when Archbishop Tutu is in front of a, an audience of young people, he gets very excited. And he was you know, just, just gesticulating and very excited and um, reaching out to these young people. And the American journalist who was moderating the panel uh, turned to him rather sharply and said, Archbishop Tutu, why are you such an optimist? And he looked at her and he shook his head and he said, oh no, dearie, I'm not an optimist. I'm a prisoner of hope. And I've thought about, I've thought about that expression a lot. We all have to be prisoners of hope because we have to ensure that we're looking at the glass which may not be half full, but there's something in that glass we can work on. Otherwise, we can get, tend to look at the negatives and all the energy goes out of doing. So let's all be prisoners of hope. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Robinson. Uh, this is an opportunity now for you to pose some questions to President Robinson. So if you have a question, please stand up and make your way to the microphone in the center, and we'll, we'll take uh, your questions. Um, I do want to pose a little, do a little quick survey here because of some of the things you said. All of you in the audience represent one or the other humanitarian organization. How many of your organizations are already doing some kind of, some portion of your work, your planning, even your field work, related to the problem of climate change? 
Raise your hands if you're already doing that sort of thing. Okay, good. So it looks to me, roughly speaking, about half the yeah. people in the room are doing mm -hmm. that. Uh, so there's good, the glass is <laughs> at least half full, maybe more, more than half full. Those are people who are prisoners of hope. Um, and, but the rest of you, I think, also have this opportunity to think about what President Robinson said and how it might apply to the kind of work you do in the field. Are you waiting for, to ask a question? Please come forward. You mind please stating your name and your organization? Sure, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sally Dunn, and I represent an NGO accredited here at the United Nations, a, uh, a faith-based organization called the Loretto Community. I am one of quite a large number of Catholic sisters who are here in New York representing our congregations, which, uh, as you probably know, many of which are worldwide in, in scope and reach. And we collectively advocate for the moral, ethical, just policies that we hope to see the UN uh, recommending to its member states. In particular, I was so touched by one comment that you made, uh, Mrs. Robinson, about your, uh, I think it was your village either in Ethiopia, your visit to that village, where you said Honduras. you were- Honduras. Honduras, sitting under the tree mm. in a fair amount of heat and talking to women. Um, many of my colleagues here uh, at, at the UN are members of a, an advocacy coalition called the Mining Working Group at the UN, and we have been fiercely advocating during the development of the um, Sustainable Development Goals that the human right to water be included in the final output. And um, indeed, we're uh, fairly happy with the results along that line. So the comment that you, that you shared with us, the, the question you got from that woman in that village, how do you live without water, just touches me deeply. And I, I wonder, how did you answer that question? I must say, I found it very difficult sitting listening to uh, one woman after another, uh, say, speaking about their desperation, they also spoke about a big um, uh, plant, uh, hydro plant nearby, which had actually taken some land from them and um, knocked down trees to make their situation worse. And they, so that was another aspect. What I did was I tried to bring their voices, not just to the government, I also met with the business community in um, Honduras. And they were quite responsive, and they were going to send people to the two areas where I was. I gave them the names of the local women's group, and there was another local community development group that they could link with, because it was a, it was a political issue that uh, Honduras is trying to, again, be middle income and um, move in a particular direction, and was forgetting the impacts of El Nino in that dry corridor on very poor parts of the population. So um, at least, you know, um, the fact that I was able to listen to her strengthened my uh, arguments later with uh, both the government and with the business community. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Sir? Thank you. My name is Patrick Alley from the NGO Global Witness. Um, I'm thinking about the issue of climate justice, and you've talked a lot about the climate justice for the victims, and I'm thinking also of climate justice for the main emitters, and you may be aware that here in the States, various attorney generals have filed a case against Exxon for misleading the public for decades about the effects of climate change, which they knew about. I'm not going to ask you to comment on an ongoing legal case, um, but the pushback from the Congre Congressional Committee for Science, Space, and Technology under Lamar Smith has been unprecedented. Mm. Subpoenaing NGOs, the Attorney General himself, and yesterday writing to the Securities and Exchange Commission asking for their emails on this issue. So I wonder if you would make a comment on what seems to be the obvious coercion of the democratic and political process on behest of a corporate. Thank you. Well, I certainly welcome um, legal challenges that can help us to have that sense of urgency and the responsibility to cut emissions or to stop denying science, et cetera. Um, I, I think it's really important. I think it's also important that, that there's a robust um, divest and hopefully reinvest in renewable energy movement in colleges and in faith-based groups here in the, in the United States. Um, I, I was very pleased to see um, legal challenges now by teenagers, by 
young people in three different states here in the United States that have gone before the, uh, the lower court at this stage. Um, so what I'm, what I'm saying is I'm not going to kind of get into the political commenting on um, how impossible some parts of your system seem to be at the moment, but um, <laughs> having just commented, I've done, I think I've done what I didn't want to do, but, <laughs> but, 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 but quite honestly, um, the more we, we see people held to account, held to account if they are denying science and paying scientists to muddle and um, you know, confuse, like the tobacco industry um, has been accountable for, um, all of those things matter uh, because we have an urgent need to change the trajectory of the, of the we're going from, um, at the moment with the commitments that governments have, they've been added up, we're on a pathway to 2.7 degrees Celsius or three degrees or four degrees. That is catastrophic. So we need all of the efforts at various stages and Global Witnesses um, is, is, is a good NGO in that regard, which I admire. Um, I think we, we just need to work harder because we have a more ambitious uh, goal now from Paris. Thank you Thank very, you very much. much. Sir? Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Michael Bowers from Mercy Corps, a leading humanitarian aid organization. Some say that actually the Syria conflict had uh, beginnings in climate change itself with a prolonged drought, especially in Aleppo government. Many young farmers forced to leave and go to the urban cities. I'm curious with your framework discussion as well as your thinking on basically root causes of conflict that may in fact be climate drivers nowadays in addition to the political. And how does that factor into for humanitarian action, both climactic change, root causes of conflict and political crises? Yes, I must say I've read uh, quite a lot of analysis of how the situation in Syria was affected by four years of quite severe drought that displaced a lot of population and caused um, some conflicts to then well up and become the terrible tragedy and unforgivable um, situation from a global responsibility um, that we have now. Um, I also uh, believe that uh, we have to uh, be aware um, of the importance of addressing um, both migrants and refugees. It was very good that for the first time, um, you know, um, uh, the UN was able to address the issue of migrants, um, 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 mass flows of migrants and refugees. Um, a, a few years ago, that couldn't be done, and so we formed the Intergovernmental Forum on Migration and Development, because the UN simply couldn't agree to talk about it. Now we have a commitment to um, two compacts, one for refugees and one for fair and inclusive migration, and countries have to take their responsibility and start working on that. That is very good, and climate is very much factored in um, to um, uh, looking at, uh, particularly, the issue of migrants. And can I follow up on that? Uh, the questioner raises an interesting point with regard to the way international organizations and individual state governments mm. are dealing with the conflict in Syria yeah. and others like it. Do you think that governments, state governments, are taking into account the climactic effects on these conflicts as they deal with ways to try to solve them? Or are they dealing with them as security, terrorism, national security kinds of issues pretty much exclusively? I certainly don't think they're doing enough of bringing together the um, impacts of climate. I know that there is now a much more focus on the security impacts of climate change, um, both here in the United States and around the world, and, and, and so there should be. And so I'm hoping that in addressing conflict situations, we will be more sensitive to the climate-driven um, nature of part of the problem um, in, 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 in seeking. And I mean, the truth is, uh, the main thing is to uh, get on track for a 1.5 world. Because if we don't, we will have more conflicts over water, over food. Um, you know, I, I, it is predictable that we will have more conflicts, that it will worsen as people get more desperate. And so um, uh, we have a, a very big responsibility, and I think the future of humanitarian action has to factor this in very seriously. So, so that, you see that as a bit of a lesson to the people in this room as yes, well, yes. that they have to I, I think I think 100% of the hands should have gone up. <laughs> 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 None of you should. Um, leave out thinking about climate in your humanitarian work at whatever level. Thank you. Sir? Good morning. My name is Victor Madrigal. I come from the IRCT, International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. 
I was very moved by the example that you gave in relation to Honduras, and it immediately brought to my mind the example of Berta Cáceres. I'm sure that you're familiar with the fact that she was killed uh, for her defense of the yes. environment. And so one of the questions that I think becomes very pressing is there seems to be a divide between the acknowledgement of the role that human rights defenders play in actually ensuring that mm. the ground uh, actions are taken and all of the actions that are perpetrated against them, including, of course, execution, mm. criminalization, yeah. and torture. And it worries me greatly that even though there's an acknowledgement of the importance of addressing and giving importance to climate change, there's also a growing toleration of torture mm. and other human rights mm. violations. And I wonder mm. what good advice do you have for us who work, work in this field mm. to actually try and, and breach that? Well, thank you for bringing that up. It's an extraordinarily important issue. The truth is that the human rights defenders at most at risk in our world today are those defending water and land rights and their environment. And um, I think this is now quite well acknowledged by the human rights community, right. and it is very serious. And I think we have to uh, just make it clear that this is not acceptable and uh, hold governments to account when, when this is the situation. And I have met, um, you know, I, 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 I was in Dublin honoring a woman, indeed, um, from Honduras, um, uh, for Frontline Defenders, the very good organization based in Dublin, which helps human rights defenders worldwide. And when she told the story of what had happened to her, her home, her children, I mean, the, the sheer brutality of everything, you know, and she felt, she said, when I go back to Honduras, I will feel protected by this award. You have made me visible, you know. So we, we really need to understand just how serious the situation is, and I honor your work in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm just going to say that I'm not sure we'll be able to get through all the questions here, so if you haven't already stood up to ask one, please, please don't come to the podium now. <laughs> go ahead, ma'am. <laughs> Hello, my name is Teresa Blumenstein. I work for Unanima International, which is a coalition of 21 congregations of Catholic sisters doing advocacy at the United Nations. And one of our key roles in that capacity is to build relationships with representatives of various governments uh, who have representation at the UN and to represent the, what is often referred to as the moral voice um, and bring that into the negotiations that occur there. And in, in that capacity, I'm very curious to know, in your capacity as a world leader, what kinds of information, what strategies of approach did you find influenced you most and helped uh, bring you around to some of your major revelations in terms of how to approach the big ball of wax that is justice. <laughs> well, thank you for that. You're the second speaker um, on behalf of a group that I know very well and, again, have had a lot of interaction with um, Catholic nuns who are really champions of um, uh, justice, equality, um, and uh, a moral voice within the, the UN system. Um, I, I sometimes say that I had a very early interest in um, human rights and equality and justice because I grew up in the west of Ireland wedged between four brothers, two older than me and two younger than me. <laughs> so from the very beginning, I had to be <laughs> asserting. But actually, I, I do have this very strong sense of justice, and it's the injustice of climate change that affects me. And that's why I found Paris such a wonderful conference. You know, this time last year, I would not have predicted that Paris would have um, that clear goal, uh, well below two degrees and working to 1.5. How did it come about? Because um, there were so many meetings beforehand. I give the French a lot of credit for the informal uh, ministerial meetings. And one after the other, the small island states, the Marshall Islands, Kiribati, Tuvalu, they kept repeating, do you want us to go out of existence? And that moral voice worked. And in Paris, we had a high ambition coalition forged by the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands of tiny atolls and a population of little more than 50,000 people. And at the end, this high ambition coalition marched in. It was the United States, it was the European Union, but in the lead was the Marshall Islands. And your voice can be like that. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. 
Um, my name is Shazia Rafi. I'm former Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action, and it's been a while since we met yeah. uh, last in the Doyle. Nice to see you. Um, I have been working for the last two, three years on the sustainable development goals, particularly getting air quality parameters into those goals. And I'm curious about um, your view on two very key races that are taking place in the international system right now with a view to having climate change and particularly air quality um, you know, held to the standards we have managed to set. One is the Secretary General race uh, where Costa Rica had a candidate who brought up the issue of climate change and environment. Uh, she was the person who helped negotiate Paris. Um, the other is that the World Health Organization has six candidates running for the next DG. And at this point, that particular work of WHO, which is on environmental health, the air quality around the world, is the area which does not get much attention, much budget, but it is kind of the, the technical way that we are going to get to the CO2 levels we want if we begin to implement that. So I'd be very curious to hear yeah. that. Certainly air pollution um, is a huge problem and a great deal of it is caused or ag ag exacerbated by um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and um, we can deal with one part of it by getting clean cook stoves to the 2.6 billion who still cook on open fires and breathe and, 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 and have a high level um, of deaths. I actually think that this is getting more traction at the international level. I know that UNICEF is preparing a major report on children and the impacts of air pollution on children. So I, I do think it is um, something that um, people are more and more aware of. And it's, um, the Environmental Protection Agency here in, um, in uh, the States has highlighted the health dimensions of climate, because that, that speaks to people. They understand that. I'm afraid this is going to have to be the last question, please. <laughs> oh, I feel terrible because of that. But thank you so much. Paul Mikov, I'm a vice president at CMMB, a global health, health organization and a professor at uh, political science in for, at Fordham here in New York. Um, uh, President Robinson, obviously, climate change is unequivocally, undeniably a, a mega trend shaping the affairs of the world. But the situation becomes particularly concerning and ominous when we consider the convergence, the growing convergence of the consequences of climate change with those of other mega trends such as the continued rapid population growth. Mm. Then on the other hand, the scarcity of resources, especially the three fundamental ones for life, water, food, and energy. And when one considers that one does not need Nostradamus to envision less than rosy scenarios for the future. And one implication that emerges from all of that is the fact that the future dominant mode will be a humanitarian mode rather than a development mode. I wonder whether this resonates with you, because this is, it seems to me, not just a matter of nomenclature or vocabulary, but it has implications for the overall posture of the industry and the sector as a whole. Humanitarian mode rather than a development mode, certainly development mode, and not the development mode uh, as we have known it for the last six plus decades. I wonder what you think about it and what the benefits might be for referencing this, this notion more frequently. Thank you. I must say I very much uh, think that we um, have an agenda now that is fundamentally a development agenda, which is the sustainable uh, development goals. And within those goals is the best way to address the importance of reducing population size. And that is educate girls and women, have health systems that work to reduce maternal mortality and child mortality, and the curve will bend as it has bent in every country. So the, the faster we move in implementing the sustainable development goals, the more we will avoid that. And we have to link the sustainable development goals now with the Paris um, uh, requirements of staying well below two degrees, working for 1.5, being carbon neutral in the second half of the century. That's also in the agreement. To me, being carbon neutral at the latest 2051 which is the second half of the century. Because if, we, if we're going to stay at 1.5, uh, have any chance, then we have to uh, be much more serious. The reality of the um, Paris Agreement coming into operation this year and at this COP is wonderful because now we have to be at implementation. And as humanitarian 
um, uh, organizations primarily um, here for this uh, wonderful symposium, um, it is in totally in your interest to pressure for full, robust implementation of the um, sustainable development goals because it would be a very sad world if everything falls into a hum humanitarian uh, basket. That's why, in relation to El Nino, we're saying we can't have this next time. Um, we can't have 60 million people worldwide in an invisible humanitarian problem because of this slow onset insidious um, issue. We have to build resilience. We have to get together in teams that break down the silos of the UN. And I'm preaching within the UN. You know, it's, it's not just a humanitarian problem. It's development. It's disaster risk reduction. It's food security. It's climate smart agriculture. It's gender. It's insurance. It's all of these things. And we have to really um, you know, work across these silos, work with the private sector, which is vital to this, work with civil society, work with the organizations. And I hope next year, when that question is asked about climate, that 100% of the hands will go up. That's what I hope for. Thank you. <laughs> just, a, just a quick follow-up. <laughs> Having worked as long as you have in, in connection with the UN, would it be some value, do you think, to have some kind of sustainable humanitarian goals, SH? G's or uh, <laughs> something like that? Well, it does seem to me that a structure to that process. They're actually built in to the um, development. sustainable development goals, um, in, in essence, because you're talking about health, you're talking about education, you're talking about tackling poverty, you're talking about all the things that um, uh, fall to the humanitarian if they're not dealt with. And, and then we have the humanitarian summit with many commitments made at that. We have the Sendai, as I mentioned. So the good thing is we, we actually have the frameworks now. We need to bring them to country level. And the, and the important thing is, this is not like the Millennium Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals are for all countries, including the United States. And that means changing habits. One of the Sustainable Development Goals is about consumption, production and consumption. We have to produce less and consume less. And I said at the um, One Young World in Ottawa, um, um, two days ago um, to a, an audience of young people, and we have to think about eating less meat, becoming vegetarian, maybe becoming vegan. And that's gone viral in Ireland, and I'm very unpopular with the farming community. <laughs> <over there. So laughs> Let's say thank you to President Mary Robinson for her participation today. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Appreciate thank it. you very much. Thank you.